Harbor Southern. We're centrally located in the heart of the River Valley, just minutes from Greenwood and Fort Smith, between Barling and Lavaca, one mile east from the Fort Chaffee entrance. We're a biblically-based family. We're made up of ordinary people serving an extraordinary God. We're comprised of a variety of folks with all kinds of different backgrounds, but we have one heart and one goal, and that's to experience authentic, spirit-led worship. So our focus is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, is to love God and to love people. Our worship times begin every Sunday morning at 930, followed by our life groups for all ages, where we look at the truths of God's Word in our lives. If you'd like more information, you can look us up on the web at firstsbc.com or on social media at firstsbc. You might be new to the area, might be looking for a, a place for your family, purpose, whatever it may be. We would love to experience our time with you here at First Southern.
All right, let me go over a couple things right quick. It's good to see you guys this morning. I'm going to set this. Whose coffee mug? Oh, sir. Sorry. Nice. All right. Obviously, today is a little bit different for us as a church. Good to see everybody. Amen. Let me go over a couple things with you guys right quick. Announcement-wise, uh, this morning, you'll see that it says in, in the announcements that um, as far as our life group situation, uh, that was printed on Tuesday, obviously, before we had... New Year and what have you, and things have changed dramatically in our community, haven't they? They've changed our church and our community. So today we have two options as far as that's concerned. Larry's class, who meets here in the auditorium, will stay here. Uh, they've been watching The Chosen. And then LB, your class will be meeting over in the fellowship hall so we can practice that social distancing aspect of all that needs to take place there. All right? It says Wednesday nights will pick up as well. Guess what? We're going to put that on hold, all right? We're going to put everything on hold just for a little bit, all that has transpired over the last 10 days or so. All right, Larry, I'm going to ask you to make your way up, and we got to have something for you to be able to, to, to make your, you know what, he can use your microphone right there by you, all right? And so you're going to read a passage for us today. Let me steal that for you, Chris. Let everybody know at home, today's a little bit different, all right? And obviously you can see from the stage and the situation which we have, um, Lee and some of our folks uh, have tested positive and other staff as well. This is Daniel Lowry. <laughs> you don't know what to say, do you? All right. Yeah. And so uh, I'm going to ask Larry to come today. Even in our preparations for today, things have changed. Uh, somewhat fluid of all the things that are taking place. Got with Chris Ron this week about preparing for today, where we are this morning. I will tell you this we are still going to look at the Word of God. We're still going to praise God in spirit and truth today, and we're going to worship Him. Amen? Amen? All right, Larry, if you would. All right. Greetings to those who are watching online. This is uh, the B or the C or the D team. I don't know. Uh, all the above. Yeah, all the above. Amen. So I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 3. There's 31 Proverbs, one for every day. And Proverbs 3 is, is a good uh, proverb to start the day out. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your, tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean, uh, on your, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and, re and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So that's the first 10 verses. It's a great chapter. And, and trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your understanding. And all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. That's, that's what we need to do for 2021. Uh, hopefully it's going to be a much better year than 2020. So let's pray and we'll uh, get started with the, the singing and worship. Lord, thank you for these that have gathered here today to worship you and, and start 2021 uh, in your house. And Lord, we pray uh, for those that couldn't be here today. And Lord, uh, many uh, are uh, usually here and uh, worshiping you and leading in these services. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their, uh, their physical condition, that you'd heal their bodies. Lord, that you'd bring them back to us quickly. Lord, for those who have lost loved ones. And uh, Lord, I, I'm thinking about uh, Buddy Smithson who, uh, who passed this past week. Lord, I just pray for his family. Lord, what a what a man of God, and Lord, how encouraging he's been through the years with his smile and his laughter and just, uh, Lord, uh, the friend he was to many of us. And so, Lord, we pray for that family and many others just like them. 
And uh, Lord, we just pray you'd be honored today as, as the music plays and as we sing uh, worship to you. And Lord, just be with Pastor Russ as he brings the message. And Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up. Let's worship together this morning. You unravel me. With a melody You surround me With a song Of deliverance From my enemies Till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer A slave
Okay, we're going to do that Calvary now. Everybody knows this one, so join on in. Years I spent in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I've learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul and glory turned to Calvary. Chris, thank you, Taylor. Appreciate you guys being here today. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 15 today. Mark chapter 15. Uh, before uh, I, I look at the Word, I want to go over a couple things right quick that I think are extremely important. Uh, I got a passage uh, today I want to look at called How to Live Courageously in Trying Times. And I don't think it could be a more important or uh, a message that we need to hear right now uh, than, than ever before. I want to read in part some things that have taken place over the last few days. The Lord has uh, used to uh, specifically speak to my heart for this time today. I've received lots of calls, texts, and emails. Lots and lots and lots. Uh, I want to read in part this one I received this past week. It says, I cannot begin to put into words 
what my church family has meant to me and to my family. Began to list out some things they've experienced over the last several months. And it says, but the one constant in our lives has been our underlying confidence in our Lord. I want to say thank you to all my brothers and my sisters at First Southern for always being there for every need we have. I'm so thankful that God led me to First Southern eight years ago. We knew what was coming. He knew what was coming and uh, that I would need my church family. My life's work uh, must have God in full control. So despite being quarantined twice, I refuse to live in fear. One of the most exciting happy days over the past several months was back in March when our church opened the doors back to in-person service. We were so excited to make the trip to Central City. It's like coming home after a big, long trip. And there's so much truth in that. And I find ourselves today when that was being sent where we're literally back there at that time. What do the days look like before us today? You say, well, pastor, it's a new year. It's 2021. We already have the memes that have gone around everywhere, all right? And they're out there. It's a new year. It means we have new opportunities. There's vaccinations. There's supposed to be a third one. All those things mean things are going to be different, right? There's so much that we need to get rid of. The reality is, is we don't know that for sure. I will tell you this. There is still much pain today. There's much hurt. There's much confusion. There's no question about it. Just within the past several days, a matter of fact, just two days ago, received an, an email from a very precious family within our church saying, Pastor Russ, would you please pray? You know the family member, you know the situation. Ask that I not say the name, and I will not until things are uh, further uh, known. But someone that you know said he is in a life-threatening situation, a very serious young man asked for prayer for him. I said, without question, we would. Uh, neighbors texting, emailing us as well, things that are going on in their life with hospitalizations. Another one last night, hospital, and COVID, pneumonia, on and on and on. With all the things that we think we've experienced over the past few months, it seems like it's uh, kind of grown over the past few days without question. There's so much that's affected within our church and in our community. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of despair. Yet we know this. Our God is faithful, and he's always in control. That being said, before I read from the passage today, I think it would be important that we begin with this time of prayer as well. So let's pray together today. Father, I, I'm so thankful for the truth and the power of your word. It seems like we've been living in the constant aspect of prayer in our life, which is what you desire more than anything but I also know, Father, there are times and points within our lives when we pray for so many with so many things going on, we don't even know what to say or how to pray. And it's in those moments and those times that your word says that your Holy Spirit prays on behalf for us. And I, I pray that same thing today, Lord. We pray that same thing today, asking that you would speak and that you would move, that you would direct. As Larry said, that you would bring healing where it needs to take place. I praise you for the faithfulness and the truth of your word. And it says in Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. And Father, we rejoice in that spiritual truth. We also rejoice in that physical truth today as well. We rejoice in that, Father. We ask that you would give a peace, a strengthening, which only you can give which can only come from you, not from anything or anyone of this world in any way, shape, or form. Lord, by all those that would be here today, by so many that would be by heart and spirit, Lord, in their living room, watching by a computer or a television, Lord, we thank you for the body of Jesus Christ. We ask that you be glorified, and we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Mark chapter 15 today. And I'm, I'm going to do something, if I possibly can, I, I'm pretty sure I can. I'm going to end out chapter 15 and begin in chapter 16. Now, that being said, there's going to be something that happens at the end of chapter 16 that you might not be familiar with. We're going to close today. I'm going to kind of throw that out there for you for next week because this is, of the Gospels, this one ends different than all the others, the other three specifically. If you don't know, you can do a little homework this week and, and see what I'm referring to. But in Mark uh, chapter 15 today, I, I think there's a passage 
this meant specifically for us at this time today. This is the first message of 2021, and uh, I, I couldn't have picked it out. I, I didn't do it purposefully. I promise you, I'm not near that smart, all right? Those of you who know me know exactly what I'm talking about, but I will tell you, I think it's a part of God's sovereign plan and his provision for us as a church here at First Southern. Amen? I, I think when we look at this, I want to read it in part. I'm going to break it down and look at this. So that we can see exactly what it means to live courageously in trying times. Look with me in verse 42. And at the evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that's the day before Sabbath, that had been on Friday, Joseph Farimathea, a respected member of the council, who was himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, and he went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. If you... If you score or highlight, this would be a good area and a place to do it. It says that he took courage and he went to Pilate to ask for the body of our Lord. Today we're going to see what it means to live courageously in trying times. And to begin with that, let me say emphatically this, that being a child of God, there has been a teaching for a while that goes around that says, if you're a child of God, you know the Lord uh, as master, as savior, that means this, that you are his and you, you, you are in his hand, which also means that, that there's nothing going to phase you or harm you in any way, shape, or form, and that life is a bed of roses and lilies and everything's great all the time. And there could be nothing further from the truth. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite of what we see oftentimes in Scripture. Those who have situations, things arise within their hearts, their lives, their families, and circumstance. Why do those things happen so often? They happen for one reason. So it's just exactly that truth that we see only what our God has done in and through our hearts and lives that to be a testimony for the world to see his grace and his mercy in action. It's important for us to understand that. And it's just as true that doesn't mean as believers that we're weak as well. It doesn't mean that we're, we're to live a life of weakness. We are to live a life of meekfulness, but not weakfulness. We're to live life full of conviction. We're to live lives of conviction. Years ago, um, when I was a student pastor uh, in, in Fort Smith, uh, we had, and some of you participated, been a part of what we call Disciple Now um, a Weekends and what have you. Uh, one of the last ones I did that just had a profound impact, what it was for my heart and my life, knowing where my kids and family and students were, uh, we had what we called uh, a weekend called uh, Conviction Weekend, and it was done for this reason, this purpose. Uh, one of the things that just stood out within my heart and my mind was this, that the, 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 the time when a person reaches 18 to 20 years old, by the age of 20, their morals and their convictions are set for life. Did, did you hear that? That by the time a person reaches the age of 20, their morals and their convictions, who they are, what they believe, are set for life. That's why they, they, when they get into college, uh, some of those folks try to tear them apart as fast as they possibly can. And that's tragic and that's sad. So we're trying to build convictions within their hearts or their lives. And, and, and one of the things we did was this conviction weekend. And because of what a conviction is. Matter of fact, I still have the shirt. It's not in, it's not in full. Uh, sleeves have been cut off and this and that. But it's one of my favorites. You know you always have one of those, right? And, and, I, and I love the front of that shirt. And it says conviction. And I did the phonetic spelling of what conviction is. Uh, matter of fact, I had it on yesterday. Conviction by definition. I'm going to give you a few definitions today. Conviction by definition from Merriam-Webster is a strong, or strong persuasion or a belief. It's convincing someone of error or compelling the admission of truth. Did you hear that? Convincing someone of error or compelling the admission of truth. That's a great definition of what conviction is. Years ago, I, I used this definition. I learned young in the ministry it's probably one of my favorite ones. One of the best definitions of conviction I, I, I love to use is conviction is this, it's something you're willing to die for. Something that you're willing to die for. And when you look at that definition, we all have convictions about certain things, don't we? There are some who have convictions over a few things, and there's some who have convictions over many things that probably shouldn't have as many as what they think is a conviction would be. And so I ask the question, what are your strong beliefs? What are those convictions that we have within our hearts and our lives? What are we willing to surrender everything for? 
Well, I'm going to tell you what. You'll never live a courageous life in the world in which we're experiencing until you have convictions set within your heart and your life. And I think the best place to start with a conviction is with our faith. With our faith. If your faith isn't a conviction in your life, let me tell you what it is. It's just convenient. And I hope we heard that today. I hope those who will be watching, those who are in the room, whatever it may be, would understand that truth. Our faith should be a conviction in our life, something that we're willing to lay down our life for because that's exactly how we got that faith. Someone laid down his life for us. If it's not a conviction in your life, it's probably just convenient. What is convenience? Well, we, we know exactly what we are. That's why we call them convenience stores. How, how many of you go into a, a convenience store every so often? You're going in and we see them on the corner. Why? Because they're convenient to pop in and out of, to get an icy, praise God. Those are good in summer, winter, fall. doesn't matter. They're, they're always good. Amen? They're called convenience stores. You know why they're called convenience? Because I'll give you another definition. Performing an action or fulfilling a requirement. Well, I found that interesting. A convenience is fulfilling a requirement, freedom from discomfort. Now, I, I have a sad feeling that that's the mindset that many have about their faith today. It's not a conviction, it's convenient. See, if you have a convenient faith, let me tell you what it is. You're just fulfilling your requirements. We're just punching the ticket, so to speak. Well, it's Sunday. Yeah, you got to get up, have to go to church. Why? Well, we have to. That's what the Bible says. Have to. You know, you know why we gather here on Sunday? Not because we have to, because we get to. Because we want to. Because we want to gather as God's people to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not emphatic about that. I'm more emphatic now than I was when I was 16 years old. There's no question about that. Amen? All right, there's no question about that. But sometimes we have this convenient faith. They're fulfilling requirements. Or they want freedom from discomfort. And I think that fits exactly where our society and especially where we are in America today. We want a faith that frees us from all discomfort. Nothing can be further from the truth. That's a total opposite of what faith is. True faith, real faith is freedom, all right. It's freedom from sin and from self for eternal life. That's true faith. You say, Russ, I thought you were going to preach from the passage. <laughs> I am. That to be said, we have to take notice of what's taking place here to kind of lay a foundation, so to speak, for what you see happening here in this passage. And I want you to notice who came and got Jesus. Who was it? It was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a prominent member of the council. A prominent member of the council of what? The same council that we just saw last week when, uh, and last week and the week before did what? Crucified Jesus on the cross. They put him to death. But this man, Joseph, was different from most of those in this council. Matter of fact, if you were to look at Luke chapter 23, it literally says that Joseph was a good and a righteous man who had a saving faith. He was a part of the council, all right, but he was not part of the council that consented to Jesus' death. And, and it kind of works like this. When they gathered that night, he and probably some other folks were not there. It's kind of like if we were to call, we just had our, our family gathering a few weeks ago to talk about our budget preparation for 2021 and all those things, and we did that. It's usually on a Sunday night this year. We did it on a Wednesday night. We were over there. But it's one of those things where you say, hey, Russ, I, I wasn't there, but this is how I vote. It doesn't work that way, does it? You got to be here to do what? To, to be present to vote in that thing. That's kind of how it works. And it's the same thing that took place at that time. It doesn't say it specifically in here, but we know according to who they were, what they did, and how they operated, that's what took place. And so when that council gathered at night to do the things they did so uh, uh, deceivably, he wasn't a part of that because he objected to what was taking place. So he was not there. Matter of fact, in, in both Matthew and John, it describes Joseph as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. 
When he's called a disciple of the Lord Jesus, which means what? He knew who he was. He knew exactly what the Old Testament said. Everything that Jesus said of who he was, he, he said, you're exactly right. That's, that's you and I identify with that, and I know you are the Messiah. He wholeheartedly agreed. He saw everything in the Old Testament uh, that would point to Messiah to come, and he said, you're him. And I can't imagine what went through his heart and his mind when he saw him on the donkey, knowing what it says in the Word of God. When he came in, they sang praises to him. And then when he saw him on the cross, how he was probably uh, disheartened so immensely. Matter of fact, so much so that it says, it, it literally says in, in John chapter 19, it says that he was in secret of who he was because of fear of the Jews. He was a believer, but he was living in fear. And I, and I tell you what, that's the problem many believers have today. We're living in fear. I love the songs which uh, you led through today, this morning, Chris. That's one of the things we even talked about. You didn't, we talked about, you said, well, where are you going, Russ? I kind of said, here's the passage, and, and you sang that song so beautifully. And I felt like in that video, and I can't think of his name, it's something, I can't think of the guy that, that sings that, that, that power. Do what? John. Yeah, it's John, and, and he's in a prison when they're singing that song. I no longer, you know, live in fear. Yeah, Zach Williams, that's it. Thank you so much. John, Zach, Ted, they're all the same. Anyways, and, and in that video, it's so powerful because they're in that prison. It's such an intimate setting, and you were seeing that. And I, I said, this is not prison. It's a church, but it's an intimate setting as well. I no longer live in fear, for I'm a child of God. And yet here we have this man, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent man in stature and who he was in that culture, and he was living in fear. It gripped his heart and consumed him. The word fear in this passage literally means dread or terror. You ever experienced that kind of fear within your life? I, I, I tell you, it's not coincidence when these things happen. They happen almost weekly as you prepare for the Word of God because this happened to me just the other night. Any tense dread or terror? Uh, there are times when, when Cheryl will take off and she'll go to bed 9, 9.30. Sometimes I'll stay up, let dogs out, watch a ball game, something like that. And so then I'll come in a little bit later, not too much later, what have you, and, and, and the lights are out and it's kind of dark, and I'll try to make my way through there. And the other night, I was making my way to, to get to, uh, to my side of the room or what have you, and, 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 and when I was walking in, I was going to go in the restroom, brush my teeth, all those things. When I was going in, someone was coming out of my bathroom in the middle of the night. And it was Cheryl, and I had no idea. And when I saw that image before me in the middle of the night, I screamed like a little girl. And she was like, eh. And I was like, it's the big one, you know? And I, I kind of had to sit back on the bed because I was not expecting someone to come walking out of my bathroom that late at night. We probably laughed for a good, she probably laughed for a good 30 minutes. It took about 30 minutes for me to settle down. But it was sheer terror which I experienced for that moment. The Bible says that he had a fear, a dread in his heart. He was gripped by it. Let me tell you something, church. To live courageously means that we don't live in fear or dread. It means we live in faith. Oh, man, the Lord just spoke to my heart this week. And that does not mean, listen, listen. And I know what's taking place in here today. I received calls and texts about this and that for church. Kathy texted me. She said, tell me about this, Pastor. I said, I, I assure you this. Uh, those who have been exposed or those who are experiencing or going through COVID, they will not be here. And I said, I, and we're going to continue to do what we do and how we do it. We don't live callously or flippant to the circumstances or situations. We address those and we want to do it in the right way. But it means that we walk in faith knowing that our God is sovereign in all things. It's important to understand. It does mean we take the necessary precautions that need to be taken. We do that. That doesn't mean as, as the, the body of Christ we show up here because we can and say we're not going to wear a mask or this or that. We, we want to take all the precautions that need to be taken, which many are doing today, which I praise God for, which many are doing by not even being here because there's not a, a possibility or there's a, a situation that might harm them physically. So I respect that and honor that. But ultimately, we trust in our Lord's hand and his provision because we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Believe me, believe me, there's, there's all kinds of ideas and thoughts and opinions that are out there. 
And I promise you, I've heard every single one of them. I, I look at this passage and I think what it means to live courageously. It means not to have this fear, this dread, but we are to walk in faith and conviction. Joseph was a respected man, meaning that he was one of good standing. It meant that he had great honor and influence in his culture and those who were around him. Literally, listen to the definition. Bearing oneself becoming in speech and behavior. That's who he was. That being said, he was scared as a believer, and that's not how we're supposed to live. What happened? What happened in Joseph's life that he needed? Well, it says in Scripture, he took courage. I, I can't help but think of the cowardly lion. Don't they always play that at Christmas time? You know, he took courage. And he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Now, now please understand what that means, church. And I, I think this is what we have the wrong mindset and idea of as well. That doesn't mean he went into Pilate's presence with great arrogance or defiance and said, Listen, you give me the body of Jesus or else. It's not what he did in any way, shape, or form. Matter of fact, the verb usage in this passage means he literally went to Pilate, not dreading through fear, but listen, he walked in in boldness of his faith. Boldness of his faith. And since we're giving out all these definitions today, since we know what conviction, convenience are, let me just give you another one today. Let's have some fun with this. Another one is spiritual boldness. Boldness, biblical boldness, is this, being spiritually confident being spiritually fearless, being spiritually free. That's a great word, amen? That's what we see from the scripture. He walked in being bold, courageous, confident. And our boldness comes through this, right belief. I love what the scripture says here. He didn't come in uh, spiritually arrogant. He didn't come in uh, in a braggadocious way in any shape or form. But he came in humbly. He came in confident. He walked in our Lord's strength and saving faith. What a great word. Now that's huge. And I, I want you to understand that's huge because you have to think about what um, other members of the council or the Sanhedrin would think about who he was and what he was doing and what group of uh, this, these folks he was a part of. We're talking about those who were uh, maybe very dear friends to him, his elders, his peers. Some of us would say his, his brothers in life, the things which they experienced. What were their reactions going to be? What were their thoughts going to be? How were they going to respond to what Joseph was there doing? Let me give you that answer. He didn't care about their reactions because he had a newfound conviction. That was supposed to be an Amen. He didn't, he didn't care about their reactions. Now hear me. He, he, he cares about who they were as his friends, his people, that aspect of you. But obviously, he did not care about their reactions. And that's important to understand. Because he had one goal and responsibility, and that was to honor his Lord and Savior. And when that is your focus, to bring honor, to bring glory and right to what's needed in a situation. Folks, that's when conviction steps up. This conviction, this courage, now gripped his heart as his fear was released. And he walked in this spiritual boldness to honor his Lord. Church, please know this. Write it down. I have it highlighted in my notes twice. Convictions always supersede others' reactions and responses. Our convictions, our biblical convictions, please get that. Football is not a conviction. You say, well, I can't be at church today because there's a big game going on. I, I got news for you. If football's a conviction, we got convenience, right? You, you know what we're talking about. There are certain things that are convictions, there are certain things that's not. But when we have biblical convictions, they always supersede the reactions and the responses of others. It's not that you don't value them, but you're not worried about their opinion. That's tough to say today. 
That's hard to say because we live in a society that says you can't do this, you can't that, hurt this person's feelings, hurt that person's feelings. I got news for you. You live a life of faith and conviction in this world, people are going to get their feelings hurt by you. But that might be on them and not be, not be, be on you. If you do the right thing in the right way and you do it in love, Larry and I were having a conversation this morning about something was taking place and something heavy upon his heart. He had been praying about it for weeks and weeks, actually probably for months, began to share that. Matter of fact, he came, we talked about this months ago, brother. I remember and said, Brother Russ, this is what I did. This is how I did it. And I did it in love. And I said, praise God. Because that's what we're called to do, amen? To live lives of conviction. Would it cost him? Would that cost Joseph of Arimathea? Without question, it would cost him. But he wasn't worried about that. He knew he had to do the right thing. He had to do the right thing. This is where this part ends for us in this passage. It doesn't say what happened to Joseph's life, what he did, where he went, and all those things, if it caused contention. And let me tell you something. I praise God for that. Do, do you see where I'm going? I praise God that doesn't say what happened because he did this and because he does that. I, I praise God because as believers, this is what we're called to focus upon. We're called to focus upon our faith, not the responses or the actions of other people. That's so important for us. Just to focus on living a life of faith and let God take care of what God takes care of so beautifully. Are we good tonight? Are we, are we good? Do we understand this importance of conviction? You say, we got it, Russ. Good, because now we're going to move on, all right? Here's the rest of the passage. So Pilate was surprised to hear she have already, that he would already have died and summoned a centurion. He asked him whether he was already dead, and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Joseph brought linen and shroud to take him down, wrapped him in linen and shroud, and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of rock, and he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now, at the end of this passage, we come to a conclusion of some things that have taken place. I think the overwhelming truth of what needs to be seen here is this. There's no denying the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some who would say, there are some, there were some, I don't understand it, I don't know why, I don't even know how, that would say Jesus didn't truly die upon the cross. I don't understand that. I don't know where you would even get it from because you couldn't be more wrong. If there's anyone that knew what death looked like, let me tell you it was. It was a Roman centurion because they were really, really good at it. That was their job of expertise. And he knew what death was. Without question. Matter of fact, what did Pilate ask him? He knew it would cost him his life if he lied to him. He knew exactly what was taking place here. Matter of fact, here's, here's what's so powerful about this part of the passage. The intent of all those who were there, they were trying to do one thing, to advert a hoax. They were scared because what Jesus said, remember? He said, if you, if you kill me, I will rise on the third day. He made that known. That was a biblical prophecy to come true. So they knew something was about to take place. So what would you do? You'd say, well, let's, let's keep that from happening. Let's keep this hoax from taking place to give these people any hope for their faith. So let's put a stone across the thing. Let's put a Roman guard, some centurions out there, so nobody will even dare think about taking him. And what I love about this is in their self-arrogance, God used his providence and did the greatest thing which he could possibly do. He validated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He validated the resurrection. What they tried to do to stop and say it's not possible, we're going to take these safeguards. God said, you can do all that you want, but in my providence, you're doing only one thing. You're making my job easier for the world to see that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The enemy sealed the tomb, but God opened it. Woo! Amen. Look with me. Let's go right into chapter 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, the mother of Jesus, James of Siloam, brought spices. She might go and anoint him. Chris, while I'm reading, won't you make your way up here, my friend? And at the very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And that's Sunday. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us for the entrance of the tomb? They had a very specific job, understanding responsibility was to take place, not to be graphic in any way, shape, or form. But the Jews would not embalm 
And so they knew that that's why they had the spices to wrap them up. We know what takes place there when some, someone, something passes away, uh, what happens. And so they're trying to cover that up with these spices and, and what have you. And they were trying to go to anoint his body. It says, looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man seen to the right side. This is where sometimes people get confused. Remember how Mark writes this, this gospel. It's very abbreviated, very intense. Remember, immediately, immediately, it's kind of how he writes it. We see it. Uh, and some would say, well, in the other gospels, it says there were two, and this says one, so obviously someone made a mistake. No, he only referenced the one that spoke. Does that make sense? That's, that's how, it, it's, it's, the example is, if we were to go out and look around the church, there's four different perspectives of what this church looks like. The Gospels give us a complete picture of what's taking place. Just because it said one doesn't mean there wasn't two. He's only referring to the one that spoke in this passage. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where, the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he was going before you to Galilee. I love what he says there. Go and tell. And there you will see him just as it was told. And he went out and he fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment. They seized him and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Today we don't live in fear. You know why we don't live in fear? Because Jesus is alive. It's just the opposite. We don't live in Isn't it a great way to start 2021? We don't live in fear in any way, shape, or form. Why? Because we're courageous and our God is alive. Jesus is on the throne and he's coming back soon. It's just the opposite. We give him praise for who he is and what he's going to do in the days to come. Amen? If you believe that, stand with me. Stand with me. We're going to sing a song. He's going to sing a song. If you know it, you can sing with him. We're going to worship today.
I want to say thank you for being here today. If you're going to be sticking around for a life group, this is how it's going to take place. But before I do so, Mike Beardwood, happy birthday today, my friend. Amen. All right. Mike turned 39 today. He's excited about that. All right. And those who are still watching, if you're still watching uh, by the internet, uh, Rada Hobbs today is her 13th anniversary day here at church in her leadership role. So Miss Rada, appreciate you. Praise God for you. All right. Life groups are going to take place in two ways. One in here, one in the fellowship hall. Other than that, we're not going to ask anybody to be in a room that's confined in any way, shape, or form. Make sense? God bless you. We will not have Wednesday night, and I'll give out an email of what's going to take place in the, in the days to come. God bless you. You're dismissed today. Thank you once again, and we were so blessed to have you be a part of the service here at First Southern today. If you have the opportunity and you're in the River Valley, we would love to have you be a part of our corporate worship service Sundays at 930 to 1030 at 12 West Central in Central City, Arkansas. Bless you and have a wonderful week.